when you first come onto the coastline, the thing that, that strikes you, that makes you gasp, is actually the modern form. The sea has cut a cliff and a wave cut platform, and if there's a beach, it sits on the wave cut platform. What it does for us, of course, is to expose rocks in their cleanest state. And here, we, we can see a very well organized situation. I'm standing on a bed of limestone. Just above it, there's a bed of shale, and another bed of limestone, more shale, limestone, shale, limestone, shale, limestone, and so on. The, the thing is that, that it's well organized because it's bedded. The sea laid it all down. It laid limestone bed, then shale over it, and so on. It's nearly horizontal, tilting slightly away from me. When you look more carefully at the cliff and as we go along it, you find that there are cracks in it. They're called faults, geologically. And I'm standing on the downthrow side of this fault. The fault is sloping slightly towards me. I'm standing on a bed of limestone, and the same bed is up there on the other side of the fault. So it's about two feet, the throw of this fault. And as you look up the fault, you see my limestone and that one, limestone, 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 and so on right to the top of the cliff with dark shales in between each light band, making it very clear. There are faults like this all the way along these cliffs, each of them formed when the rocks failed, suddenly and explosively, as a result of huge stresses building up within them. We experience these sudden movements as earthquakes, and faults this size indicate quite big ones. A foot or two of movement may look small, but there are millions of tons of rock involved, so the energy required was enormous. Today, we only get relatively minor tremors in Britain. The big earthquakes occur in other parts of the world on earthquake belts. The world's earthquakes, with their epicenters in the ocean or on land, make a definite pattern. The world plot of volcanoes generally follows the same lines. Both belts mark the margins of plates, large rigid blocks of crustal rocks that are moving relative to each other, moving the continents about with them. This movement used to be called continental drift. These continents, North America and Europe, South America and Africa, are moving apart steadily and, and very slowly. It, the maximum rate is about three centimeters a year, which doesn't sound very much, but if you translate that into geological time terms, it means in a million years, 30 kilometers, in a hundred million years, 3,000 kilometers. And that's the rate at which Britain is moving away from North America. Now the movement is initiated along the plate margins which are down the center of the Atlantic Basin. It's called a constructive margin because new material is being added to the sea floor there. Just imagine a cross section through that constructive margin. There's a long wide tension crack in the ocean crust which allows molten magma to well up and fill it. The magma cools into hard rock adding to the width of the ocean floor. Sometimes magma escapes to the surface to build volcanoes. We have these kind of volcanoes, of course, now in Iceland, in the Azores, and in Tristan da Cunha, in exactly the right kind of place. But of course, as the Atlantic is opening, so on the other side, the Pacific is closing. And the edges of the plates are around the edges of the ocean basin. That's a, these are destructive margins because the ocean floor is being destroyed along those lines. At destructive margins, the seafloor plate has broken and is slowly sliding below the surface at an angle of about 45 degrees. As the plate descends, deep earthquakes occur around it, and the friction and disturbance of its descent melts some of the rocks above it so that volcanoes erupt, making a range of coastal mountains along the continental margin. If there's no continent above the plate, volcanoes erupt in the sea, making island arcs. Meanwhile, the ocean is steadily closing. 500 million years ago, the continents and their moving plates made a totally different pattern. This ocean is called by geologists Iapetus. Iapetus was the father of Atlas, and this is, in a sense, an ancestor of the Atlantic. Now, this over here is uh, a proto-North America, and here is an ancient version of Europe. And we are, of course, looking at this as the ocean begins to close. Now, it's important to us because Britain 
was divided between those two continents then. Scotland and Northern Ireland are attached to the North American continent and England and Southern Ireland attached to the Proto-Europe and they closed like that. Now in the last decade numbers of geologists have been working on the effects of all this on the British Isles and one of them is Dr Stuart McKerrow who is here. Here we have a large-scale map of the British Isles showing Scotland and Northern Ireland on one side of the Apertus Ocean and England and Wales on the other side of the Apertus Ocean. About 500 million years ago, this ocean was about 2,000 kilometers wide. And Scotland and Northern Ireland were part of North America and England and Wales were part of Europe. Both uh, edges of the ocean were uh, edges of destruction where the ocean was going down underneath the continents. Let us look and see what happens at the northern edge first. The first thing we notice is that there were volcanoes in Aberdeenshire, in Argyllshire, in Donegal, and in Galway. These volcanoes were the direct result of the ocean plate going down to depths underneath the margin of the continent. Then, while these volcanoes were going on, we also had a lot of sediment being piled down onto the ocean, probably rivers flowing from mountains in the north of Scotland and Greenland uh, came into the ocean from to the northeast of Scotland and carried down the type of muddy sandstone that we call grey wacky. Now these grey wackies accumulated to a great thickness and as the ocean moved northwestwards under Scotland these grey wackies refused to go down with the basalts of the ocean plate and instead they got scuffed up because they're lighter and then after the first bit of scuffing up took place, there were more grey wackies were laid down in the ocean. And then these younger ones get scuffed up and so on repeatedly so that we have a series of faulted blocks of sediment making up the south of Scotland and some of the central parts of Ireland. These, this faulty block was gradually uplifted with time and forms now what we call um, the southern uplands the bit of Scotland between Berwick and Stranra, and the hills south of Belfast in, in Ireland. In 1975, geologists were very fortunate in that the British Gas Corporation put a pipeline through right across the southern uplands, and this exposed a trench about 10 feet deep, showing us the structure of the rocks. And we were able to confirm that the structure of the sediments in the southern uplands was exactly the same as the sediments in Oregon and other places where we see scuffing up taking place today. There are quite a few quarries where the grey wackies are exposed. Here, the sloping lines of the bedding show that the sediments were folded. We can recognize thin beds where the current was running slowly and coarser and thicker bands where currents were faster. This particular quarry slices neatly through a hillside and gives us a very good section through a piece of undulating country. Because the great thicknesses of grey wackies are all very similar in their resistance to erosion, there are few crags and cliffs. This is the typical southern upland scenery of gently rolling hills. High up, where trees are scarce, the grey wackies have weathered into a strangely austere landscape of deep hollows and valleys. Lower down, where trees cap the hills, they become more docile and domestic. In addition to the volcanoes and the scuffed up sediments, we have a third bit of evidence from Girvan, which is just north of the southern uplands on the west coast of Scotland. And here we see some rocks that are 500 million years old that were emplaced on the edge of the continent before the scuffing up took place. From a study of modern ocean sediments by deep sea drilling ships, we can see that these rocks at Girvan resemble rocks that occur below the seas today. Along the coast at Ballantrae, there's a stretch of over five kilometers that shows a slice of deep marine rocks laid out on their sides, so that the top is at one end and the bottom at the other. At the lowest level, among the pillow lavas, we'll find Jeremy Leggett, one of my research students at Oxford. We can tell an awful lot from a cliff of pillow lavas like this. I think you can see that all the pillows are aligned in a vertical direction here. Their long axes are upright. Now, when pillow lavas erupted on the ocean floor, 
they tend to be in a fairly viscous state, and so they flow out into an ovoid shape. Now, that was originally horizontal, and yet these are vertical. So we've got pretty good evidence here that these things have been tilted up through 90 degrees so that they're now in a vertical condition. And there's something else you can say as well. Because they're viscous, and although they're cooling rapidly, the new pillows will tend to sink down. Their bases will sink down into the spaces between the pillows below. And you can see that very clearly here. And so we know for sure that because this is the base of this particular pillow, and there are lots of other examples, the succession must be younging up the coast. And in fact, we found that the rocks are in fact younger as you go in that direction. We've come all the way up through the pillow lavas now, and we're now quite clearly in a sedimentary rock. And this hard red bedded sediment is called jert. If you were to take a thin section of this, you'd find it was made entirely, or almost entirely, of the microscopic bodies of small animals called radiolaria. And in the ocean basins today, radiolaria exist in myriads in the surface waters, in the plankton. When they die, their bodies rain down on the ocean floor and create a substance called radiolarian ooze which over a period of tens of million years transforms into chert. And this accumulates very slowly at the rate of only a few millimetres every thousand years. And we think that these rocks here are the 500 million year old equivalent of this. And we're pretty sure that this is a piece of fossil ocean crust. Now, let us turn our attention to the south side of the Apatus Ocean. Around 500 million years ago, we find a sequence of grey wackies running through the north of the Lake District very similar indeed to the grey wackies that occur in the southern uplands. These grey wackies are intruded by volcanoes and they give us volcanic rocks in the Lake District and in Wat Waterford and Wexford. These volcanic rocks started off uh, below sea level, eventually build up into a long chain of islands, an island arc. And then about 450 million years ago, this island arc was covered by younger grey wackies so that we have a sandwich. The older grey wackies and the younger grey wackies uh, come uh, on either side of the volcanic rocks. With this difference in composition of the uh, rocks, we find that cleavage is developed when the rocks get folded. And we have quite a number of slaty beds that are cleaved because of the pressure, because the softer rocks get squeezed in between the harder ones. Once you know what you are looking for, the various kinds of landscape in the Lake District are quite distinctive. The lowest, oldest rocks are sediments which give Skiddaw the same smooth contours as the grey wackies we saw in the southern uplands. You don't have to climb the mountain to look at the rock it's made of. There are exposures of it in the road cuttings nearby. And there's no difficulty in recognizing its slaty characteristics. The rocks of the volcanoes that erupted through the Skiddaw Slate generally have rougher, knobblier outlines like the Langdale Pikes. They are known to geologists as the Borrowdale Volcanic Group and form Great Gable, Scarfell and many other mountains. From the air, there are the unmistakable signs of volcanic activity, successive lava flows piling up on top of each other and making a distinctive layered pattern. The step pattern made by weathering of the lavas is called trap topography, and you can see it at ground level as well as among the peaks. But not all the volcanic rock is lava. There's a large amount of ash that also makes quite sharp and craggy contours. When this kind of rock is quarried, you can see the telltale lines that mean it has accumulated in layers, almost certainly in water. After the volcanoes, though, the Lake District had another thick layer of marine sediment, more grey wackies. These make up the landscape of low rounded hills along the M6 near T Bay. Looking north along the motorway towards Penrith, there's a deep cutting on the left through Jeffreys Mount for the upper and lower carriageways. 
You aren't allowed to stop and look at it, but there's a view across from the valley to the east. And there's no doubt at all that these rocks have been folded and faulted. Now, while these rocks were accumulating in the Lake District in southeast Ireland, we also had rocks accumulating in Wales. In Wales, we had a basin surrounded by high mountains in Anglesey and Pembroke and in the Midlands of England. And these mountains were being eroded and sediments were flowing into the basin and going out northeastwards into the Apatis Ocean. Periodically, at different times in different places, volcanoes came up through these sediments. So that in, South, in Wales, we have a mixture of volcanic and sedimentary rocks. The fa most famous area of volcanic rocks is the Snowdon area in North Wales. And probably the largest hill of sedimentary rocks in Wales is Plinlimon in Central Wales. Most people who visit Wales recognize the rocks of Snowdon as volcanic. Though we have to remember that as in the Lake District, the original volcanic cones have weathered away, and the summit we see today wasn't one of them. These crags were carved within the last million years by glaciers. In sharp contrast, the grey wacky landscape of Wales spreads eastwards from Snowdonia across the Denby Moors to Clwyd. And in central Wales, there's a more robust version of it though still smooth, in the mountains of the Plinlimon range. In much of Wales, ice, as well as water, has played a large part in weathering the landscape we see today. After about 450 million years ago, the ocean stopped going down underneath England and Wales, but it continued going down under Scotland and Ireland, so that the most recent volcanoes connected with the closing of the Apatis Ocean occur in Scotland and Northern Ireland along a line about here. In addition to these volcanoes, we can also see signs of how the ocean closed. It appears to have closed very obliquely. And as it did so, large faults developed along the margins of the Scottish uh, continent uh, where we had uh, softer rocks above the ocean floor going down underneath. These faults took a long time to develop. Uh, some of them may have uh, developed slowly with intermittent earthquakes over about 50 million years. And the sum total of the length of movement on these faults may amount to 20 miles, 30 miles, 100 miles. Different faults have moved different distances in Scotland uh, and Ireland. Some of the faults show resemblances to faults occurring today in, in California. So, so far, we have seen four types of evidence about this old ocean. The volcanoes, the scuffing up sequence in the southern uplands, the ocean floor material at Girvan, and the faults. But there's a fifth kind of evidence, the fossils. 500 million years ago, two of the marine animals that lived were trilobites and brachiopods. The trilobites have a lot of segments, rather like lobsters and crabs today. The brachiopods were shellfish. Uh, both the trilobites and the brachiopods lived in shallow water and they couldn't get across a deep ocean. So we find that when we come to look at the map of the trilobites and brachiopods as they existed 500 million years ago, we see that we get one group of species in England and Wales and Southern Ireland and a different set of species in Scotland and Northern Ireland. The Scottish and Northern Ireland species are like those in North America. The English and the Welsh ones are like those in Northern Europe. And it was this idea that first suggested to geologists that the most reasonable explanation of the fossil distributions is that there was an ocean in between too wide for the fossils to get across. And this is reinforced by the fact that as time went on, about 450 million years ago, we find that the fossils start getting across this ocean. And some of the Scottish fossils uh, start to inhabit areas in England and Wales where there used to be English ones. And this, as far as I'm aware, is the first recorded invasion of England by Scots. It's curious how often geological events have foreshadowed our own human history. 
But the uniting of northern and southern kingdoms is not the only effect on Britain of movements of continents and their respective plates elsewhere. After all, we're now on the edge of the Atlantic Ocean, so when that formed, it split the old continent on a new line. And we've been nudged once or twice during geological history by movements elsewhere. Only 300 million years ago, as Africa collided with North America after it had collided with Europe, then mountains were crumpled up in Devon and Cornwall. And much more recently, only 20 million years ago, as the Mediterranean closed and the Alps were folded up, so we got a wheeled and anticline and those spectacular folds in the Isle of Wight. Now, if you can digest all this, then you begin to interpret landscapes from a different standpoint and at a different scale. It's much more fascinating than legends of the lost continent of Atlantis, for instance, uh, because it's nearer home and nearer the truth. And if you're not quite convinced, then just dwell for a moment on that vast estuary on our northwest coast, the Solway Firth. Somewhere in this border countryside, whenever we cross between England and Scotland, we're crossing from ancient Europe to ancient North America, flying, driving, or even just walking over the healed scar of a whole lost Atlantic Ocean. A BBC book to accompany the series is available from bookshops, price £2.95. Now it's just 19 minutes past 12, and that brings us to the end of this morning's programmes for schools and colleges. At 12.45 we have the news, followed by the weather, and then Pebble Mill at 1. In the room, Roy, BBC One is returning to a trade test room.